Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I'll be talking about interpretability today. Um, there'll be a bit of like choose your own adventure where we can dive a little bit more into details on something or skip ahead. I'll take a poll as we get to those parts. Um, I'm here to, to <clears throat> both you know, share a bit of my research, but also I spend a lot of time just thinking about interpretability. So what I hope today is to also just lay a bit of framework or groundwork, because many times we think of interpretability as this, oh, this is a really fuzzy sort of thing, right? <laughs> and I hope by the end of today, um, it's a little bit less fuzzy and you see ways to connect it to maybe things that you're working on. Um, before I go into the talk, I just want to acknowledge all of the many, many collaborators um, that I have worked with over the years um, to produce all the material here, uh, students in my lab, the clinical collaborators, um, it, 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 as you all know, this is such an interdisciplinary endeavor when it comes to the maths, the, you know, the sciences, um, the human interaction components. So just to give a little bit of motivation, uh, I'll talk about a project um, from several years ago that we ended up digging into a bit more in detail just um, this semester, where we were trying to figure out what uh, drugs work best for patients who have uh, major depressive disorder. And you know, our model did some modeling and it took patient data and it outputted something like, oh, like recommend Prozac to this group of patients, fine. Um, we use some interpretability stuff because we know that our data, which are electronic health records, have all sorts of problems. Um, and we found that the main factors were pregnancy and UTIs, urin urinary tract infections, as being factors that suggest that Prozac might work. Um, now, it only took a PhD, no MDs, um, to suggest that maybe this is thing that happen more often in women. <laughs> um, and so then we were like, oh, maybe there's something about like female biology, right? Um, there's a lot of like biology oriented people in the room, right? There, there are definitely sex differences. So maybe there's something about Prozac and, and female biology. <clears throat> we talked to our clinical colleagues and they're like, no, no, no. Um, the main thing is that OBs and gynecologists would end up being primary care uh, points for many women um, who end up seeing their OBs or gynecologists much more than they see a, you know, a PCP, um, are, are taught to be extremely conservative, basically. And Prozac is the safest antidepressant on the market, um, also used for children. And so what's going on here is that it just, you know, this is the, the first thing that people will prescribe and it happens to work. And that's really all you're seeing. Now, maybe that's fine, right? But it was really important that we understood the process that was happening such that we didn't come up with some fake hype conjecture, right? That maybe there's some important biology um, that is happening. And so interpretability at a high level, it's critical when the problem cannot be fully formulated, right? Because if you can do it, if you can turn the problem into math, then there's no reason to have things be interpretable. But as you all know, when you're at the intersection of you know, math and science, um, machine learning, AI and science, um, you can't check everything computationally necessarily. And so then that's where the interpretability comes into play. Um, and there's lots of examples. I'm, uh, you know, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into all of the details. But you know, there's been time and time again where we have you know, built something and we weren't sure exactly what was going on. We weren't sure whether to trust it. And you know, being able to look inside the algorithm helped us determine what was trustworthy and what was not. Now, as I said, one of my major goals is to help give you a little bit of the landscape, right? Of like, but what does interpretability really mean? And to start digging into that, the first thing that I want to mention is that there's really two different types, major categories of use cases. So interpretability is all about the use case. And there's two major use cases that I see for interpretability. So the first one is validation or oversight, right? This is the example in the Prozac, like, is this model doing something real? So here's a you know example of a decision tree that we distilled down from a neural network to explain uh, you know when patients are put on ventilators and when they're taken off ventilators in the ICU. And you don't need to look at the thing, uh, but the idea is that someone was going to look at this and was going to use this to validate you know hey do we think that the neural network is overall doing something reasonable, right? And then the other case um, which I consider insight is maybe on how do you get better human plus AI teaming, right? So in one case, we're trying to determine, you know, maybe before a system is deployed, is this ready for the world? Is the model gonna do a great job? Um, do I wanna invest a huge amount of wet lab resources 
um, in this thing, right? So that's an oversight sort of example. Um, and then the insight sort of example is, okay, now there's a doctor, the doctor is sitting there, they're trying to determine what, uh, what drug to prescribe for this patient. You know, what information can I surface that will hopefully produce something better than the doctor or the AI alone, right? Because if the AI was always better than the doctor, you just replace the doctor. Right? If the doctor was always better, then why bother them with this tool? The, really, the hope is that somehow you get something better than either of them alone. Um, and, and later in the talk, I'll talk about the specific study where we tested with 200 psychiatrists. If we gave them different ways of presenting information about a recommendation and some drugs, um, you know, what, you know, how did they respond? Right? Um, and interpretability being this interdisciplinary endeavor, it's not just math and science, it ends up being a lot of HCI as well. So a lot of uh, my research these days um, also involves that human factors element. All right, so for the rest of the talk, um, first I just wanna describe the interpretable machine learning ecosystem and how that works, um, or at least how I've kind of put it together to make it much less fuzzy, at least in my head. Um, and then what we'll find is that there's two major types of interpretability. So I'll spend some time talking about both of those uh, different categories. And then I'll end with a relatively small amount of time on human factors and also like large surface models, foundation models, LLMs, et cetera, are kind of all the rage these days. Um, and what does it mean for interpretability in these you know, settings that we really haven't seen before in the context of AI? <clears throat> all right, so let's start with this interpretable machine learning ecosystem. So here's how I think about interpretability. Um, and there's a lot of lines and arrows and stuff, um, but I think that you know, we follow this through. Um, we, we kind of have at least a solid way of thinking about this is no longer fuzzy. So the way I think about the system um, is that there's, the, here's normal machine learning, there's data. The data um, you know, are, are go into a model, outcome some sort of prediction or action if you're doing reinforcement learning. Um, and then there's some loss function uh, that determines the score and the models trained to um, optimize on that score, right? So that's kind of what the normal machine learning ecosystem looks like. Now, in the context of interpretability, there's always a person involved. That person might be doing oversight. So that person's job might be, do we deploy the system or not? Or that person might be trying to do the insight, right? Like what, what medicine do I give? And does the system help me make a better decision? In either case, the human is trying to take an action. Ultimately, you know, go, no go decision on the system, uh, drug recommendation, and the world scores that decision, right? And importantly, that score is different than the score that was used to score the machine learning system, right? And so the idea is that there's some system context. The model can send, um, you know, its prediction to the human, that could be just a recommendation, please you know, recommend Prozac or something for this patient, um, but it can also send additional information. And so for my purposes, um, and I think it's really important to define terms because in machine learning, we keep reinventing new terms all the time and it's like really frustrating, <laughs> yeah? Um, is that any, any information about the model that goes to the person, I'm gonna define as the explanation. So in some cases, that might be the model itself. So if it's a little decision tree that you decide to learn, um, then the model is a decision tree and the explanation is also the decision tree. Um, but in other cases, we might only get a partial view of the model, um, you know, that, hey, this is how the model behaves right around this point or this location. And that's also a form of explanation. So we're gonna define explanation as something about the model that's being passed to the human. All right, so that's the basic setup of the ecosystem. And I wanna emphasize that this is also what allows us to make the enterprise rigorous because at any point in time, we can always score against this score function, right? So we know that we have a good interpretable system if you know, we get better scores over here. If somehow the information that was passed along was the, the right information. <clears throat> All right. So now I, what I wanna do for you know, the bulk of the talk is to really dive into those two modes. So the first mode is inherently interpretable models where the model serves as its own explanation. <clears throat> and this is a really good setup in high stakes situations 
because if you're only seeing part of the model, you there's a lot that you're not seeing, you know, kind of by, you know, kind of obviously. And what we find is that there are lots and lots of domains, especially in the clinical settings, where there's just there's enough noise in the domain that throwing a really large model at it doesn't actually make that much difference. And if you're clever about it, and that's going to be like what we're going to talk about for the next chunk of the talk, if you're clever about it, you can actually make relatively small models, models that can be inspected by humans, by scientists, by domain experts, um, that are also, um, you know, highly performant, right? And in fact, if, even if they were slightly less performant than your deep net model or your ginormous random forest, you might trust them more because you know that it's not making some sort of silly uh, confound mistake or something like that. So for the next section of the talk, I'm going to talk to you about three ways to actually accomplish that task, right? How do you get a model to be small and highly performant, right? If that's gonna be the game you're gonna play, um, we might decide that the game is not worth playing and then we need to just look at a partial view of the model, but for now, let's, let's try, right? So the first thing that I'm going to talk about um, is in the context of generative modeling. We do a lot of generative modeling in our lab because uh, when we work on clinical, applications, it's very natural to think of the patient having some sort of condition um, that you don't see. Um, and that produces data that you do see, and it also produces the outcomes that you do see, roughly speaking. So the kind of generative view is very natural. It's also very natural when we talk to our colleagues, uh, our clinical colleagues, because that's how they're thinking, right? There's something going on in the human body. We can't fully see it. We only get the measurements. Um, and then we imagine that there's some parameters here uh, that describe how this thing happens, and there's some parameters that describe how the outcomes happen. <clears throat> now, a trickiness with this is that there are lots of dimensions of human data, right, like, or the data that comes, you know, patient data, um, and in general, the, the outcomes will be relatively few, right, um, and so if you go about setting up a model that looks kind of like this, like a supervised generative model, it's not going to pay attention to the right components, right? Because if you think about this from a generative modeling perspective, um, you know, what to make one an error in this dimension is the same as making an error in like this dimension over here. Um, and so, you know, why not just screw up your predictions of your outcomes, but you want to make good predictions on the outcomes because that is kind of making sure your generative model is useful, right? Um, I'm sure all of you have had, or many of you, if you're working with like large dimensional data, have had the experience of like you, you throw some dimensionality reduction at the data, and like the first thing that pops out is like, oh, it was a used, you know, batch effect, right? Like it was run through this machine versus that machine, or, you know, a gender effect, or, or you know, something like this. It's really uninteresting, right? It's not the effect that you want to find. And yet, that's what the biggest signals in the data are. So the whole goal is that we really want to use our outcome dimensions to guide this generative model toward the parts that are relevant. So we wanna build a small generative model because we're gonna have to look at it. The way we're gonna make it small is we're gonna ask it to focus on dimensions through a, a specific loss function that says that try to explain the data the best you can. So this one's just saying try to explain the data. Um, and then also make sure that your predictions are of high quality. So go, you can take the data and you can predict why, um, it, which involves having to integrate out whatever the patient conditions were, um, but you can do that, right? Um, so make sure that you do that properly. So we set this up <clears throat> and then um, this objective captures what we want, um, but it is somewhat hard to optimize in particular because of that integral bit business that's kind of going on here that you can't actually write this down as inference in a standard graphical model, which is unfortunate. Um, so what we have done is we've considered, oh, sorry. Um, actually, first, first decision point, <laughs> yeah, in terms of where we go for the rest of the, where, where we focus for the rest of the talk. So um, I, if people are really curious about like why it's important to set up the objective this way mathematically, we can go into a little detour and, and talk about why this is the right way to set this up. If you want to trust me and decide <laughs> or read a paper later, if you're curious, um, we will skip ahead to like how we can make this thing easier to optimize. So more math of why this is the right objective, a few people. 
Um, uh, skip ahead to a simpler way to optimize this problem. Very few people are raising their hand, but I think I got a few more for skipping ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, if there's time toward the end, I can I can come back. All right. So you know, some math happens. Um, uh, you know, if if I would convince you that this is the right way to set it up, um, because there's there's important elements. But trust me, <laughs> that that's the right way to set up the objective. Um, uh, but as I said, there's no graphical model that corresponds to that, and it's kind of hard to work with. So one thing that we have done more recently is we've said, let's simplify a little bit and say that here is the, the hidden variable. Um, it produces the outcome and the data. Uh, and then we're gonna have this switch parameter P um, that determines um, you know, for every variable uh, or every dimension of X, is it relevant? So now it's like a simplified version of the problem that's basically saying, these, tell me which dimensions are relevant. The dimensions that are relevant um, are modeled by the hidden variable Z. And the dimensions that are not determined to be relevant kind of just go in a trash pile with extra, you know, some extra parameters. And so we're trying to figure out what's relevant and the, the ones that are relevant is that they need to hopefully explain why, right? Because if you put everything in, in the relevant bucket, then you'll do a crappy job of being able to predict why. But if you put the stuff that's relevant to predicting why, uh, in the relevant bucket, um, you'll, do a, you'll do a good job. Um, and this P parameter is set up to encourage things to end up relevant if they can be. But if they can't be relevant, if you start sacrificing performance and why, you start cutting them out. And this is a now this is a standard graphical model. And the question is, if you do normal inference, right? Because we want to be able to pick your favorite inference for your graphical model. If you do inference with this model, you know, how will it perform? Will it do the right things? Um, and as it turns out, the answer is yes. Um, we can show that um, inference in this graphical model gives you something similar to that initial, you know, task constraint setting that I gave you. Um, and importantly, like we, what it does is it's not, it's not perfect, right? It's not going to always work. But what we did here is we explored different signal to noise ratios and numbers of relevant dimensions. So if you can imagine there's kind of two things that can make, differentiate, make the problem hard. One can be that there, you're, you're really looking for a needle in a haystack. There's a very few number of relevant dimensions and most of them don't matter. And the other thing could be that, you know, everything's just so noisy. It's really hard to tell whether something is part of relevant or irrelevant because there's just very little signal that's connecting X to Y or the relevant dimensions of X to Y. Um, so that's the two things we're varying over here. So we're varying the number of relevant dimensions, and then we're varying the signal to noise ratio. And it's very simple, you know, just to demonstrate the point sort of example, where we have um, a component, we have these two, um, sorry, we have these four blobs of data, and, the, and we are only allowing you to explain those data with two Gaussians. Um, and so the question is, will we end up with Gaussians that align with the colors? So the colors are Y. Or will we end up with, a, with Gaussians that either just one single Gaussian, everything's trash, or will we end up going in the wrong direction, right? Um, and we can vary the sizes of these clusters and how close they are and how many dimensions um, are belonging to them. And what we find with our approach, so if you, if you do a normal um, a Gaussian mixture model, um, how many, uh, over what regimes do you end up with the thing that you want in yellow? These are the regimes where you end up with this guy over here. You know, because you, you ideally want to find the dimensions that align with your signal. Um, and then with our approach over here, um, we find that, you know, there's still regimes where things fail, um, but we have many more regimes where we can find those relevant things. So this is, again, this is a simplification, right? The original objective would get you kind of this in all regimes. Um, but here's something that's much easier to work with, much easier to optimize, um, and it still gives you this um, in most regimes. So I, I think this is a kind of cool trick because like the, it's simple, right? Um, it, that's the whole point. But we kind of did the analysis to show that it will do the right things. Um, and it, or when will it do the right things? And hey, well, okay, there are certain times where it'll break. So the signal to noise regime is just not one that we can work with. All right, so that is kind of the, the background of right, like trying to make these models small. Um, what can we actually do with it, right? Um, let me give you a little taste of that. Um, and then we'll go on to some other ways of making models small. 
So here's an application that's not Gaussian mixtures. It's in, in a reinforcement learning setting. We're trying to identify uh, when to give certain interventions in the ICU. Um, and we're applying the same set of ideas, but now to the reinforcement learning problem of building a policy. Um, and so the hiddens correspond to the hidden states of a patient that are evolving over time. Um, and we want it to be interpretable because when we learn a policy for when to, for how to treat hypotension, low blood pressure, we want clinicians to be able to look at it and, and validate that it's reasonable. Um, so we end up with an objective that says, you know, we want to explain the data, but also have high quality value. And we don't need to worry too much about the details for now. Um, but what we find um, is that uh, we can build models that explain the data well um, and have a fairly high estimated value um, over here. And importantly, if you only look at the value term, um, say just perform well, you know, this is green over here, um, but we can get something as good or better that also explains the data. And the hope here is that if we have a model that explains the data, then it's more, it's more sensible for someone to look at, right? It's gonna make, a, a, it's gonna be easier to interpret. And we were able to do this with only five hidden discrete states. Um, oh, I didn't tell that the story, but we, in, in the previous work, we had done this with like 128 hidden states with like an RNN. And I, like our doctors were like, what? <laughs> we, we don't get, there's nothing we can do with this. Um, and we were able to get similar results with only five hidden states, which is like a huge thing, again, by using these sort of tricks. The problem with this, so this was, this was awesome, uh, but the problem was that five hidden states is still kind of funny to wrap your head around if you think about it. Because the way you think about hidden states is you, you know, if you're Bayesian, <laughs> um, is you put a belief over them, right? A distribution. So at any point in time, you're not really reasoning about five discrete things. You're reasoning about a distribution over five discrete things, which is not necessarily easy, again, for uh, doctors to be thinking about. So this was huge, but it, we still had work to do, which is why we need method number two. So here we used a very different tactic. So first tactic was using a task to figure out what was relevant and irrelevant and throw out the irrelevant stuff that helps us make our model small. Um, this one is most relevant in the decision-making scenario, which is the focus of most of my work. And we realized that we really only had any business doing statistics in situations where doctors disagreed. Because if the doctors always did the same thing, there is no statistical basis to suggest something else might work. Now, you all in this room are doing all sorts of like cool biology. So maybe you have like some chemistry or biology facts that might suggest something else might work. But for us, just looking at the electronic health records, you know, we have no other data to, to go on, right? Um, so here we are, and, and just in cartoon, if you look at all the blue colored states um, that patients are going through, the same action is always taken in those cases, like it's always A1 or A2. But if you look at the uh, yellow and red states, there are different actions being taken in those states. And those are the states where, um, you know, we're like, okay, let's just condense down this model and say that, you know, our model only consists of two states, only the yellow state and the red state. So this is the idea that we used. Um, applied it to that same hypotension management task and found um, you know, 14 different, you see I'm a real computer scientist, I started with zero, right? Um, 14 <laughs> different <laughs> regions um, that, uh, you know, that, that where the disagreements happen. And we were able to put down the key values associated with the, uh, sorry, all the dimensions, you know, uh, like vasopressors, um, mean arterial pressure, lactate, all of these, on one slide, right, to show to our colleagues and say, these are the places where there's disagreements uh, about what sort of treatment to give, right? We, we could cluster them all into these settings. A lot of details into how to do that clustering properly, but here we have it. Um, and the, the lovely thing about this was that it was small enough, fit on a slide, they could spend enough time just looking at it. They're like, this is funny, because there's a lot of values where the mean arterial pressure map is over 65, but hypotension is defined as having map under 65. So what is going on, right? Like with your data processing, um, this doesn't make any sense. They also suggested some additional features. So we did it again. Um, this time we find 19 states after correcting some data issues. Um, and this time they were like, okay, look sensible. 
And in terms of the value of interpretability, this is it, right? We wanted them to be able to find these sort of mistakes um, or funny things, um, tell us about it. And then we, you know, we were able to fix the model and, and get something that they found was sensible. And the lovely thing here is that because there's so few states, we could visualize the policies, the action, uh, the decision-making policies under several different reward functions. So here we were like, there, there could be a policy that say to increase the blood pressure. These are the actions you should take among these four actions in each of the states. If you're reducing the probability of mortality based on a model, um, if you wanna increase final survival based on a rollout, you know, we could try these and see where do these different choices of reward functions agree in terms of actions where they don't. So it also helped the doctors kind of think about, because it's so hard to specify reward. There could be a separate talk about reward design. Um, and they were able to compare all these things. <clears throat> the other thing, so it was, it was a win from an interpretability perspective, but I also want to emphasize it was a win from a statistical perspective. Because in, a, in the original work, which I didn't talk about um, in, in this talk, um, when we use those 128 dimensional RNNs, uh, we ended up having an effective sample size of about 10, right? Which is really small, um, or, or on order 10. And then with the task focus POM DP, which was the, that five state thing that the doctors had were struggling with, um, you saw that effective sample sizes were in like the 70s, right? So on order 100. And this one was on order 1,000. So we got, basically got another order of magnitude of statistical support while also making this kind of small and interpretable. So if you're, if you're doing this sort of thing, I, you know, I really recommend, like this is like a great way to make your problem small and the statistical validity. Like I spent a lot of time thinking about batch reinforcement learning. Um, and this is one of those tricks that I feel like it's just not used um, often enough. All right, <clears throat> so two tricks done. Um, last trick um, to go. Um, if you're really committed to making your model small, um, sometimes the complaints or people come to me and they say, but you know, this problem is too complicated. <laughs> There's no way to turn it into like an HMM or you know, like a discrete clustering on states. And that's fair. There are a lot of problems that are more complicated than something that simple. Um, and in this case, what we have done is some, a, a couple of projects, so I highlight just one, um, where we introduce hierarchies um, that are interpretable at every stage. So one project that we did, this was a prediction-oriented project in the, with ICU data, was that let's say you have a bunch of time series. Um, we went through basically all of our discussions with the doctors about like how they describe time series. And they would talk about trends that go up or trends that go down, or, hey, there's a lot of variation uh, in the values for this patient. Um, this, this value has been below this level for the like, last couple of hours. I'm starting to get concerned. So we basically took their vocabulary um, for how they define the features of these time series. But we left a lot of holes, right? Like which dimension, how many hours, what threshold, all of these sort of things. Um, and so those became the intermediate features. Then there was the next level, which you know, we hoped didn't quite turn out, would turn out to be something semantically meaningful and then outcome the predictions, right? So this is the architecture we set up. Um, it required a little more work than a standard neural network to optimize because it's more constrained. Um, but we did some, we, we did manage to optimize. We came up with an algorithm. Um, we got good predictions. Um, but the important thing is that we were able to then describe where the predictions were coming from to the clinicians. So we were able to say, hey, there's four concepts. So concepts are this layer over here, this supposedly means something layer. Um, and these concepts are made up of, um, uh, you know, the first concept is made up of, you know, these weight, the, uh, you know, these features, um, this sort of feature summary with this type of weight, and then we're leaving out some more details of some of the parameters. But we were able to get the clinicians to look at something like this and say, do these things mean anything to you? And the answer was no, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but at least it gave us a starting point. This one is done by an undergrad, an awesome undergrad, Carissa Wu, who graduated, so we didn't quite get to close the loop. Um, but it's something that we kind of have uh, as like an ongoing question um, in the lab. So again, three tricks, right? Use a task to figure out what's relevant. Um, find out where there's disagreement if it's a decision-making problem. And the final one is like, hey, there are interpretable ways to set up hierarchies. And we put these all together. Um, we can end up 
creating mo small models in a surprising number of situations, basically. Um, that many times people are like, oh, it's not possible to create a small model, but in fact, with some cleverness, you can. Um, so I, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to very briefly mention this other detour. Since, since, since the math people got like short shrift last time, <laughs> this is a shorter math detour. Um, but I do want to emphasize that it's not trivial to set these things up. Um, and they're really interesting technical problems that come up along the way. Um, so in this particular case, um, one common way to train models that look like this um, is to make everything soft, right? Like, if you want this feature to be binary because that's what people understand, you'll pass it through like a softmax because you know how else are you going to take your gradients and do your optimization? Um, and so let's say that's the soft layer over here. Um, so it turns out if you try to train it that way, you can get some serious cheating going on because now the model in the prediction stage is learning that, hey, there's a number, there's a real valued number rather than a zero one, which contains more stuff in it. So if this concept over here was supposed to mean like on sedation or something like that, but now you've decided that, well, when it's 0.95 to one, that means on sedation and something else, right? You can sneak information through um, that's not related to the intended concept that it's trying to re represent. Um, and you can see this, um, in terms of accuracies, so um, th this is the soft accuracy and the hard accuracy of a zero one, and you see that there's a lift, there's increasing accuracy uh, as you in uh, between the hard concepts, the, the ones that are forced to be zero one, and the ones that are allowed to go through the soft max, right? And we don't want that from an interpretability perspective, because then people could be misled. Um, you tell them that this is what's going on in the model, you give them something that looks like this, but it's actually doing something else. Um, so we came up with a way around that with, um, to basically use autoregressive processes to um, make sure that information between concepts, like correlations between concepts are carried over, and also um, a, a side channel to allow for additional information to be captured. And this we trained you know, proper, properly in, the, in, in terms of like with hard zeros and ones. So the problem is that in the past, if you tried to train with the hard zeros and ones, you got worse performance. Um, that was because the model without the hard zeros and ones was cheating, right? <laughs> so the question is, can we get close to a performance that the cheating model does without, um, without the cheating part? Yeah. Um, and so the answer is yes. Um, we were able to, you know, with, with these few changes to the architecture and appropriate inference, um, we were able to basically get ourselves to a situation where we can match performance of the, the cheating model without the cheating part. And, and when you try to change concepts, it actually does the right thing. Um, so I won't, I won't go into detail there, but uh, happy to answer more questions after. But just emphasizing that there's a lot of like, interesting technical problems that come up even when you're trying to do like, this very fairly basic sort of thing. All right. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. And without the, the cheating issue. Okay, but what I want to do, um, and I will, I, I will try to make sure, I, so my goal here is I'll end at five and I'm happy to hang around and answer questions. I know we started a little late, but I also want to respect the fact that if anyone needs to leave. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is briefly talk about how I explain the partial view version um, and also additional considerations that I promised you at the end. So the partial view version is, um, all right. So if you, so hopefully because, you know, the fact that I spent most of the talk talking about the inherently interpretable models, I really think there's a lot of value in those and they're underused mostly because they're hard and they require certain innovations, but now you know some about them and maybe you will use them. Uh, but sometimes it's not possible, right? Sometimes it's just not possible. Um, and the idea with a partial view problem is like, can we describe, uh, you know, just part of the model, right? This, this line is too squiggly, but I will describe just this part of the line to you um, because that's the part you need to know about because that's the point of interest, okay? Um, and this applies to most commonly often comes up with image data sets. So we actually have a collaboration with folks at the Broad um, uh, where we are trying to classify angiograms as having lesions and plaques. Um, so here's the original angiogram uh, image, uh, image from the angiogram rather. Um, and then here is a, oh, it's a different one, isn't it? Oops, sorry. Okay, that's, that's bad. Um, but here, here's an example of a partial view um, that highlights what the model is attending to. 
it's only showing what the model is attending to on a single example, right? So it's definitely a partial view. It's not how the whole convolutional architecture works, but hopefully it gives you a sense of whether the model is looking at something sensible, yeah. But the important question, as I noted, is you know what part of the model is being explained and can we be transparent about that? <clears throat> and so when you see something like this, there is really a question of what part of the model um, is being explained. And the way I like to think about it is against what contrast, right? Like when you ask, uh, so, so Tim Miller has this great um, discussion on explanation of, and also on human explanation, where he talks about like when you say, you know, why is the door closed? You know, it could be, um, you know, versus why is the door open? But it also could be, why is the door closed versus why is the window closed, right? And there are different alternatives, right? The, so when we ask, when we, when, he, when we provide explanations to each other, sometimes implicitly, um, there's always an alternative against which we're providing the explanation. And so when there's a partial view, the important question to ask is, you know, like, what is this information providing? You know, it, it's a differential against what? Um, and different methods provide really different <laughs> explanations. Um, so here are different methods, um, and uh, these are all the same model. I really want to emphasize that this is exactly the same architecture, the same model, um, but different explanation methods are showing us different parts. And this is ours over here. So ours is a um, basically a complete against nothing method. So our approach is trying to say, what are important parts of the image, important parts of the image to look at um, complete, like uh, as a whole against like a blank image. And so that's why you see it, um, it is a bit longer. It, it, it tends to follow the vessel in both cases. And so it's saying that, okay, in general, it's kind of important to notice that there's a vessel. So it's like kind of one thing that it's pointing out versus like a blank image. And then it's saying, that, hey, there's certain parts of the vessel um, that might be more important, right? And you can see that other methods don't necessarily have this property. You know, they might be saying, you know, oh, look over here. This is probably where um, the, the lesion is, uh, but against what, right? Um, and so uh, that's one thing that we're really playing around with. Um, there are a lot, a lot of methods to do saliency, to, to identify, highlight parts of images. Uh, but they don't necess they're not necessarily very transparent about what they do and don't do, uh, which is ongoing work that we have in the lab. As I noted, this is like, you know, recent workshop paper uh, that is still continuing. All right. Um, so now with the last bit of time that I have, I want to dig into just a little bit about these additional considerations. So I mentioned at the start, this is an interdisciplinary endeavor, requires people, um, but all of, so far it's all been all technical stuff. So in terms of involving people, I want to tell two stories um, uh, that are kind of important, I think, to, to kind of, at least for me, I remember, uh, like, okay, people, you know, we were talking before, I was like, people are kind of strange. I was like, no, no, we're all, we, we're people, right? We're all kind of strange, or we're all normal or something. You know, we, but we behave in ways that we don't always think about um, when we're actually building, uh, when we're sitting in the mindset of building models. So the first thing I want to talk about is we did this study where we did where we use example-based explanations. And there's a lot of work suggesting that examples are a good way to show someone something. So if you are trying to explain how an agent is going to behave, show them a couple of examples of like, oh, here's how it drives a car. Um, you know, here's the sort of meds that it recommends, and people will get a sense of how it behaves. And we found two really important things when we did this study. This doesn't mean that explanations based on examples are a bad idea, by the way. It just means that we have to do everything carefully. Um, the first thing I found is that the way in which things were presented um, really changed how people thought about um, the, uh, the examples. Uh, so we presented stuff that looked more like a picture of a time series. So here we have, um, um, so we have our time series of different values of things that are changing over time. So like red, you know, this is the, the value at time step three. Um, and we gave some examples of these time series in this sort of format. Um, and most people here tended to use some form of imitation. So if we gave you a new setting, you would say, ah, like that happened. You know, that looks a lot like this one over here. I bet the agent will do treatment B or treatment A. Whereas if we provided it somewhere like this, 
people tended to presume that there was a goal location. So if we provided only a few arrows um, of what is done by the agent in those locations on the map, people tended to think, oh, the agent is trying to get somewhere um, and there must be a, like a goal somewhere on the map or a set of goals on the map. Um, it's two very different forms of thinking. One is a copying mode of thinking um, and the other is a goal-directed mode of thinking. And we found that it, it really depended on like how, it, how people kind of knew the domain. Like we all kind of know navigation domains. Now, maybe if you were a doctor um, and these were real things, then maybe this would look like, oh, you're trying to navigate the patient toward having a low viral load or something like that. Um, but it, it, it really depends on the person and their background and the context that they're bringing. Um, and even in, within the domains, there was still significant variation of how people use the information. And, and why is this important? It's important because you're hoping that by providing a few examples, a partial view, right? A, par a few examples is another form of partial view that people will get it, right? And they'll be able to know if the system works or, they, or whatever, but they might not, right? They might actually extrapolate to how the system will behave in new settings completely differently than the system actually does. That was the first uh, first story that I wanted to tell. Um, that has to do with like how people extrapolate, how people think. Um, the second one um, goes back to that very first example uh, that I gave about human AI teaming. We worked with those 200 psychiatrists and we asked them uh, to uh, use different forms of explanation. And uh, roughly at a very high level, uh, they there was an anti-correlation between explanations they liked and explanations that made them perform well. Um, it turned out that there were certain explanations that forced them to read more. This was unintentional. <laughs> there was an explanation that was really easy to skim. And there was another explanation that had more text. Um, and they didn't like the explanation with more text. They were like, this is like wordy. It's not skimmable, we're in a rush. Um, but it turned out they paid more attention when they had to slow down and read all of the text and they made better decisions. And so we followed, that, that was work in 2019. We followed up on this, uh, you know, how, how can you, like if people are doing a lot of boring stuff like reading radiology slides or making a lot of these decisions um, and they just have to get through it, um, how can you help them with this issue of cognitive labor? Because if we ask them to engage all the time, now this is in a teaming context, like insight context. If you ask them to engage all the time with their full brain, they're gonna be grumpy. You would be grumpy, right? If you had to do that all the time. Um, uh, you know, it's not like they're being lazy, it's just kind of natural, right? If the system is reasonably good, you just stop paying attention. Um, so we tested, you know, based off of, for example, the difficulty of a question, um, you know, do we provide AI assistance before, which kind of encourages you to turn your brain off? Or do you encourage, uh, or do you turn the AI assistance on after? So you're forced to commit to a choice and then the assistant comes and tells you, hey, maybe you want to do something else, right? Um, and the after case is, is slower. So what we see here um, is that you see that AI after always costs more in time. Um, and the AI before always is less time because again, you can turn your brain off and just do the thing. Um, and what we found is that we could speed people up on the AI before case um, by about 12 seconds in this particular task with no change in accuracy, because these are like um, uh, in, in certain cases. Um, but uh, if you, uh, sorry, right. So if, if you did this, if it did it before in, in, in aggregate, you know, you got them faster, but no, no better accuracy. But if you did it after, um, you got significantly better accuracy, but it took more time, right? And so that's where you figure out your time trade-off. And maybe you can get that time back. Sorry, this is what I was meant to say first. Um, in the AI, in the easy case. Right, so for the easy problems, you know, there's no benefit to showing it after, except it takes more time. Um, but if you show it before, um, you save time, right? So maybe this is where you get the clinician buy-in by saying that there's certain times where we're just gonna kind of let you skip, right? Because it's gonna be an easy question. And certain times we're gonna ask you to do a little more work, um, but it's for a good cause, right? <laughs> uh, you're gonna get better predictions out. Um, so this is a really recent work. Um, so this is from a workshop over the summer um, and we recently submitted work where we kind of push into this effect a little more and we're trying to personalize it to each person because it turns out that this is not just a, people respond differently to this sort of feedback. There's basically people who don't trust AIs and people who do. Um, and 
uh, each group needs different types of intervention um, and we're trying to do the personalization. All right, so basically that was to say human factors are important and we should pay attention to them. Um, and then the very last thing I'll say um, very briefly, because I'm a little over time, is just a lot of the stuff I said, um, I think it applies to a lot of context. It's not like just because LLMs have appeared on the scene, the rest of machine learning doesn't exist anymore. Um, uh, that said, I, I do think that these large surface models ha are creating like a fundamentally different regime for us in terms of validation. Um, we, you know, like I said at the beginning, like you can turn your problem into math, then you don't need the interpretability, right? Because, uh, you know, the math tells you that you're doing the right thing. And, and to that, you know, the math might be theory, but the math could also be like enough empirical testing, right? Like if you can really carefully empirically test your model and all the regimes it's gonna be used, then you don't need to know why it works. It just, you just know it's gonna work, right? And I think that's the big change with these foundation models, with the large surface of these models, is that we can't, we're not gonna be able to cover the space. Um, and so this is something that my HCI colleagues and I have been ch chatting a lot about recently, um, where for these large surface models, we, we feel like we really need a paradigm shift toward um, you know, how to get human engagement at path time for each specific output of the model. You know, that, that like asking for that brain effort, right? Um, that we were trying to do. Um, how can we build mechanisms to get the right sort of engagement with the outputs of these models you know, at the time that they are being used um, rather than like a priori, okay, this thing is ready for deployment, uh, go. And uh, many times we think of reinforcement learning or machine learning as like the big problem, like what, it, what are the subtypes of this disease? Um, what are the right treatment options for this set of patients? But I encourage you to think about sometimes the, the important stuff is in the mic micro problem of like, how can we get people to engage, right? That's to me another reinforcement learning problem um, that might be just as important as the, you know, the, the macro problem of like, you know, the, the, the scientific discovery um, element. So again, very briefly there. Um, so just to, to wrap up, and I'm, then I'm happy to take questions and, and people who need to leave can leave. Um, interpretability is, is, is valuable in many cases. Hopefully, um, if you weren't convinced of that, you're slightly more convinced of that now. Um, and the right form of interpretability does depend on context. It's a little squishy in that sense, but there's always a loss function, right? Like we could test those psychiatrists and see if they were making better decisions. Um, we could test those, um, you know, synthetic user, user studies with like synthetic problems and be like, okay, their rate of correct answers changed based off of this explanation. So there are ways to make this thing rigorous. Um, and uh, with the appropriate forms of like kind of math and human factors, right? If we're clever in the right ways, um, we can get these interpretable models in just about any situation um, that we, we need them um, to be able to get that better validation in teams. Thank you all very much. I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks for a nice talk. So I have a question about like if you have for the same task, if you have a simple model that's inherently interpretable and you have also a complicated model that's not as interpretable, but it's, it has a higher accuracy. So where is the threshold of uh, accuracy difference for you to decide that, okay, maybe you're going to switch to a larger model? Like practically, how do you decide? Right, so I think, so I get this sort of question a lot. And the, the thing I go back to is like, I feel like the, all the research in my lab, those, those three major tricks, they're all trying to get to the point where the simple model has similar performance to the complicated model. And in many cases that is possible. Um, and then also trying to make, trying to find ways to check to see whether the, I mean, a simple model you can check, you know that it's causal or whatever. Um, is the big model, is the more complicated model cheating somehow? Like, is it getting those better results because it's taking advantage of like some, you know, weirdness in the data processing? So that's what I keep coming back to, like that many times, that's the first thing we try to check, right? Like, is there, um, it, where is the gap coming from? Is the gap coming from, you know, like something that's that uh, like that's cheating, or is it coming from you know some something that just cannot be captured by the simple model? Um, if it's something that can't be captured by the simple model, then sure, you can use other ways of you know partial views to try to validate that bigger model, um, and it really comes down to the to the domain. Yeah. Thank you for a very nice talk. Mm -hmm. um, so 
Mostly when I work with interpretability, it's for generating hypotheses. I'll start mm -hmm. out with a lot of data that I don't know a lot about, but yep. I have an idea about how things might sort of link together. Mm -hmm. um, but usually I, I'm currently using a lot of like post hoc interpretability methods. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, like wondering what are your thoughts on this? Uh, these two different ways of having inherently interpretable models or yeah. post hoc models for doing. Uh, I think it's a great question, and I, I think it's generation. Really a, an interesting way of like how science is getting done um, these days. Where I I think that one reason why we have focused a lot on the inherently interpretable models is that we are we are more decision making focused. Um, so we're trying to. Come up, come up with recommendations, and and at that stage, it's like close enough to something that's like going to affect the world that we're like, okay, we want to, we want everyone to, we want the clinicians to check all the the twenty, uh, you know, uh, states and make sure everything makes sense. Um, whereas in your case, and maybe kind of relates to the previous question a little bit as well, um, maybe there's a different type of question to be asked. It's like, well, if we train a really, if we train a more complicated model on all this data. And it's able to do this, then now we have a system that we can kind of computationally prod as much as we want because it's in silico, it's not like in a, in a wet lab or something. And we can try to now basically do science on the model, right? Um, and try, like, by, by doing, you know, like, just how we do science on LLMs or something like what's going on in the LLM, what's going on in your scientific model. And I think that's a very legitimate way of, of doing science. And, you know, because you don't have to run loads of experiments or all of this sort of thing. Um, and again, you kind of have to use the right techniques to dig to make sure that is the effect you're finding due to, uh, again, like, is it real or is it due to, yeah, yeah, of course. But um, yeah, yeah, I think for the purposes of like scientific discovery, I think there's absolutely really valid use cases for partial views of big models, yeah. Well, I wanna touch on the last thing you said, which yeah. is scientific discovery. So, um, for me so far, what you know presented today sounds more of feature importance or supervised learning where you more or less know the the type of solution that you're expecting and kind of mm. like, you know, it's more about figuring out how you explain what you know. But, you know, in terms of scientific discovery, sometimes we want to know something new, right? Like something that is not obvious from the data or you could think about it in, in supervised learning. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm not sure if you can talk a little bit more on how sure. you're thinking about this problem Absolutely. of new knowledge. A significant chunk of the work that with, when I talked about those Gaussian mixture models, I guess I jumped from those straight into like, you know, reinforcement learning. But we have done what we've absolutely done work where we use um, this task focused learning to learn relevant subtypes. So we're trying to learn, well, okay. We have discovered subtype, or we've discovered patterns that are uh, that help predict, you know, psychiatry outcomes. And so, in that case, it has to do with okay, we have a pile of electronic health record data. Um, if we just throw like topic models or clustering or whatever at that data, we will find that some patients have cardiac disease, some patients have kidney disease, some patients have diabetes, because this is the dominant signal in the data. Um, and what we really want to know is that are, is there interesting variation in psychiatric disease? So that was our question. And when we were trying to answer that question, we said, well, let us make up some outcomes, right? Like, hey, does this patient stay stable on a particular drug? Does this patient who has depression now uh, turn into someone who actually had bipolar? Um, you know, does this patient, someone who's gonna leave the hospital system or the care system? So we came up with a bunch of like outcomes that don't really kind of vaguely pass if we're a clinical journal, but not really. But what they did, is that we, uh, we use those in our task-focused modeling to say that, okay, the hidden variable is the subtype, the disease subtype. Um, the outcomes are these like kind of proxies having to do with psychiatry. And then over here, we have a bunch of, you know, EHR data. And so we end up finding, uh, you know, okay, uh, you know, patients of this, with, with, these ty with this type of psychiatric comorbidities you know, have these type of outcomes, patients with these type of, so, so it, is an it is a fully unsupervised setting, or rather it is an unsupervised setting and the supervised task is not so much there to, because we're really interested in predicting the particular outcome, but it helps focus the unsupervised learning on the variables of interest. Because oftentimes we, it's not data, it's not data and noise, it's 
relevant signal versus irrelevant signal. Because like the fact that they got a broken leg is, is a very, it's, it's a signal, right? It's not noise. Um, and so we're trying to separate like, uh, again, signal that we care about from signal that we don't care about. And we use a supervised task to help uh, filter which signals to keep. Thanks. Thank you. So maybe we'll take more questions okay. directly afterwards. So thank sure. you so much yeah, for this wonderful yeah. talk.